Chapter 49 380 Totally wanting in reason and good sense. The canon was amazed to hear the medley of truth and fiction Don Quixote uttered, and to see how well acquainted he was with everything relating or belonging to the achievements of his knight minus errantry, so he said in reply. I cannot deny, Senor Don Quixote, that there is some truth in what you say, especially as regards the Spanish knights minus errant, and I am willing to grant too that the twelve peers of France existed, but I am not disposed to believe that they did all the things that the Archbishop Turpin relates of them. For the truth of the matter is they were knights chosen by the kings of France, and called peers because they were all equal in worth, rank and prowess, at least if they were not they ought to have been and it was a kind of religious order like those of Santiago and Calatrava in the present day, in which it is assumed that those who take it are valiant knights of distinction and good birth, and just as we say now a knight of St. John, Oregon of Alcantara, they used to say then a knight of the twelve peers because twelve equals were chosen for that military order. That there was a Cid as well as a Bernardo del Carpio, there can be no doubt, but that they did the deeds people say they did I hold to be very doubtful. In that other matter of the pin of Count Pierre's that you speak of, and say is near Baby Aca's saddle in the armory, I confess my sin, for I am either so stupid or so short minus sighted that, though I have seen the saddle, I have never been able to see the pin, in spite of it being as big as your worship says it is. For all, all that it is there, without any manner of doubt, said Don Quixote, and more by token they say it is enclosed in a sheath of cowhide to keep it from rusting. All that may be, replied the canon, but by the orders I have received, I do not remember seeing it. However, granting it is there, that is no reason why I am bound to believe the stories of all those amatuses, and of all that multitude of knights they tell us about, nor is it reasonable that a man like your worship, so worthy, and with so many good qualities, and endowed with such a good understanding, should allow himself to be persuaded that such wild crazy things as are written in those absurd books of chivalry are really true. Don Quixote Chapter 49 381 Chapter 50 Of the shrewd controversy which Don Quixote end The canon held, together with other incidents. A good joke, that, returned Don Quixote. Books that have been printed with the king's license, and with the approbation of those to whom they have been submitted, and read with universal delight, and extolled by great and small, rich and poor, learned and ignorant, gentle and simple, in a word by people of every sort, of whatever rank or condition they may be minus that these should be lies. And above all when they carry such an appearance of truth with them, for they tell us the father, mother, country, kindred, age, place, and the achievements, step by step and day by day, performed by such a knight or knights. Hush, sir, utter not such blasphemy. Trust me I am advising you now to act as a sensible man should. Only read them, and you will see the pleasure you will derive from them. For, come, tell me, can there be anything more delightful than to see, as it were, here now displayed before us a vast lake of bubbling pitch with a host of snakes and serpents and lizards and ferocious and terrible creatures of all sorts swimming about in it, while from the middle of the lake there comes a plaintive voice saying, Knight, whosoever thou art who beholdest this dread lake, if thou wouldst win the prize that lies hidden beneath these dusky waves, prove the valor of thy stout heart and cast thyself into the midst of its dark burning waters, else thou shalt not be worthy to see the mighty wonders contained in the seven castles of the seven fays that lie beneath this black expanse, and then the night, almost ere the awful voice has ceased, without stopping to consider, without pausing to reflect upon the danger to which he is exposing himself, without even relieving himself of the weight of his massive armor, commending himself to God and to his lady, plunges into the midst of the boiling lake, and when he little looks for it, or knows what his fate is to be, he finds himself among flowery meadows, with which the Elysian fields are not to be compared. The sky seems more transparent there, and the sun shines with a strange brilliancy and a delightful grove of green leafy trees presents itself to the eyes and charms the sight with its verdure, while the ear is soothed by the sweet untutored melody of the countless birds of gay plumage that flit to and fro among the interlacing branches. Here he sees a brook whose limpid waters, like liquid crystal, ripple over fine sands and white pebbles that look like sifted gold and purest pearls. There he perceives a cunningly wrought fountain of many minus colored jasper and polished marble, here another of rustic fashion where the little mussel minus shells and the spiral white and yellow mansions of the snail disposed in studious disorder, mingled with fragments of glittering crystal and mock emeralds, make up a work of varied aspect, where art, imitating nature, seems to have outdone it. Suddenly there is presented to his sight a strong castle or gorgeous palace with walls of massy gold, turrets of diamond and gates of 
Jacinth, in short, so marvelous is its structure that though the materials of which it is built are nothing less than diamonds, carbuncles, rubies, pearls, gold, and emeralds, the Don Quixote. Chapter 5382 Workmanship is still more rare. And after having seen all this, what can be more charming than to see how a bevy of damsels comes forth from the gate of the castle in gay and gorgeous attire, such that, were I to set myself now to depict it as the histories describe it to us, I should never have done, and then how she who seems to be the first among them all takes the bold knight who plunged into the boiling lake by the hand, and without addressing a word to him leads him into the rich palace or castle and strips him as naked as when his mother bore him and bathes him in lukewarm water and anoints him all over with sweet minus smelling unguents, and clothes him in a shirt of the softest sandal, all scented and perfumed, while another damsel comes and throws over his shoulders a mantle which is said to be worth at the very least a city, and even more. How charming it is, then, when they tell us how, after all this, they lead him to another chamber where he finds the table set out in such style that he is filled with amazement and wonder to see how they pour out water for his hands distilled from amber and sweet minus scented flowers, how they seat him on an ivory chair, to see how the damsels wait on him all in profound silence, how they bring him such a variety of dainties so temptingly prepared that the appetite is at a loss which to select, to hear the music that resounds while he is at table, by whom or whence produced he knows not. And then when the repast is over and the table's removed, for the knight to recline in the chair, picking his teeth perhaps as usual, and a damsel, much lovelier than any of the others, to enter unexpectedly by the chamber door, and herself by his side, and begin to tell him what the castle is, and how she is held enchanted there, and other things that amaze the knight and astonish the readers who are perusing his history. But I will not expatiate any. Further upon this, as it may be gathered from it that whatever part of whatever history of a Knight minus errant one reads, it will fill the reader, whoever he be, with delight and wonder, and take my advice, sir, and, as I said before, read these books, and you will see how they will banish any melancholy you may feel and raise your spirits should they be depressed. For myself I can say that since I have been a knight minus errant I have become valiant, polite, generous, well minus bred, magnanimous, courteous, dauntless, gentle, patient, and have learned to bear hardships, imprisonments, and enchantments, and though it be such a short time since I have seen myself shut up in a cage like a madman, I hope by the might of my arm, if heaven aid me and fortune thwart me not, to see myself king of some kingdom where I may be able to show the gratitude and generosity that dwell in my heart, for by my faith, senor, the poor man is incapacitated from showing the virtue of generosity to anyone though he may possess it in the highest degree, and gratitude that consists of disposition only is a dead thing, just as faith without works is dead. For this reason I should be glad were fortune soon to offer me some opportunity of making myself an emperor, so as to show my heart in doing good to my friends, particularly to this poor Sancho Panza, my squire, who is the best fellow in the world, and I would gladly give him a county I have promised him this ever so long, only that I am afraid he has not the capacity to govern his realm. Sancho partly heard these last words of his master, and said to him, Strive hard you, Senor Don Quixote to give me that county so often promised by you and so long looked for by me, for I promise you there will be no one of capacity in me to govern it, and even if there is, I have heard say there are men in the world who farm signiories, paying so much a. Eh? Don Quixote Chapter 5383 Year, and they themselves taking charge of the government, while the Lord, with his legs stretched out, enjoys the revenue they pay him, without troubling himself about anything else. That's what I'll do, and not stand haggling over trifles, but wash my hands at once of the whole business, and enjoy my rents like a duke, and let things go their own way. That, brother Sancho, said the canon, only holds good as far as the enjoyment of the revenue goes, but the lord of the signiory must attend to the administration of justice, and here capacity, and sound judgment come in, and above all a firm determination to find out the truth. For if this be wanting in the beginning, the middle, and the end will always go wrong, and God as commonly aids the honest intentions of the simple as he frustrates the evil designs of the crafty. I don't understand those philosophies, returned Sancho Panza. All I know is I would I had the county as soon as I shall know how to govern it, for I have as much soul as another, and as much body as any one, and I shall be as much king of my realm as any other of his and being so I should do as I liked, and doing as I liked I should please myself, and pleasing myself I should be content, and when one is content he has nothing more to desire, and when one has nothing more to desire there is an end of it, so let the county come, and God he with you, 
and let us see one another, as one blind man said to the other. That is not bad philosophy thou art talking, Sancho, said the canon, but for all that there is a good deal to be said on this matter of counties. To which Don Quixote returned, I know not what more there is to be said. I only guide myself by the example set me by the great Amadis of Gaul, when he made his squire count of the Insula Firme, and so, without any scruples of conscience, I can make a count of Sancho Panza, for he is one of the best squires that ever knight minus Aaron had. The canon was astonished at the methodical nonsense, if nonsense be capable of method, that Don Quixote uttered, at the way in which he had described the adventure of the Knight of the Lake, at the impression that the deliberate lies of the books he read had made upon him, and lastly he marveled at the simplicity of Sancho who desired so eagerly to obtain the county his master had promised him. By this time the canon servants, who had gone to the inn to fetch the sumpter mule, had returned, and making a carpet, and the green grass of the meadow serve as a table, they seated themselves in the shade of some trees, and made their repast there, that the carter might not be deprived of the advantage of the spot, as has been already said. As they were eating they suddenly heard a loud noise and the sound of a bell that seemed to come from among some brambles and thick bushes that were close by, and the same instant they observed a beautiful goat, spotted all over black, white, and brown, spring out of the thicket with a goat herd after it, calling to it and uttering the usual cries to make it stop or turn back to the fold. The fugitive goat, scared and frightened, ran towards the company as if seeking. Don Quixote Chapter 5384 Their protection and then stood still and the goat herd coming up seized it by the horns and began to talk to it as if it were possessed of reason and understanding. A wanderer, wanderer, spotty, spotty. How have you gone limping all this time? What wolves have frightened you, my daughter? Won't you tell me what is the matter, my beauty? But what else can it be except that you are a she and cannot keep quiet? A plague on your humors and the humors of those you take after. Come back, come back, my darling and if you will not be so happy, at any rate you will be safe in the fold, or with your companions, for if you who ought to keep and lead them, go wandering astray, what will become of them? The goatherd's talk amused all who heard it, but especially the canon, who said to him, As you live, brother, take it easy, and be not in such a hurry to drive this goat back to the fold, for, being a female, as you say, she will follow her natural instinct in spite of all you can do to prevent it. Take this morsel and drink a sup, and that will soothe your irritation, and in the meantime the goat will rest herself, and so saying, he handed him the loins of a cold rabbit on a fork. The goat herd took it with thanks and drank and calmed himself, and then said, I should be sorry if your worships were to take me for a simpleton for having spoken so seriously as I did to this animal, but the truth is there is a certain mystery in the words I used. I am a clown, but not so much of one, but that I know how to behave to men and to beasts. That I can well believe, said the curate, for I know already by experience that the woods breed men of learning and shepherds harbor philosophers. At all events, senor, return the goat herd, they shelter men of experience, and that you may see the truth of this and grasp it, though I may seem to put myself forward without being asked, I will, if it will not tire you, gentlemen, and you will give me your attention for a little, tell you a true story which will confirm this gentleman's word, and he pointed to the curate, as well as my own. To this Don Quixote replied, seeing that this affair has a certain color of chivalry about it, I for my part, brother, will hear you most gladly, and so will all these gentlemen, from the high intelligence they possess, and their love of curious novelties that interest, charm, and entertain the mind, as I feel quite sure your story will do. So begin, friend, for we are all prepared to listen. I draw my stakes, said Sancho, and will retreat with this pasty to the brook there, where I mean to vittle myself for three days, for I have heard my lord, Don Quixote, say that a knight minus errant squire should eat until he can hold no more, whenever he has the chance, because it often happens them to get by accident into a wood so thick that they cannot find a way out of it for six days, and if the man is not well filled or his alfor was well stored, there he may stay, as very often he does, turned into a dried mummy. Don Quixote Chapter 5385 Thou art in the right of it, Sancho, said Don Quixote, Go where thou wilt and eat all thou canst, for I have had enough, and only want to give my mind its refreshment, as I shall by listening to this good fellow's story. It is what we shall all do, said the canon, and then begged the goatherd to begin the promised tale. The goatherd gave the goat which he held by the horns a couple of slaps on the back, saying, Lie down here beside me, spotty, for we have time enough to return to our fold. The goat seemed to understand him, for as her master seated himself, 
she stretched herself quietly beside him, and looked up in his face to show him she was all attention to what he was going to say, and then in these words he began his story. Don Quixote Chapter 5386 Chapter 51 Which deals with what the goatherd told those who were Carrying off Don Quixote Three leagues from this valley there is a village which, though small, is one of the richest in all this neighborhood, and in it there lived a farmer, a very worthy man, and so much respected that, although to be so is the natural consequence of being rich, he was even more respected for his virtue than for the wealth he had acquired. But what made him still more fortunate, as he said himself, was having a daughter of such exceeding beauty, rare intelligence, gracefulness, and virtue, that everyone who knew her and beheld her marveled at the extraordinary gifts with which heaven and nature had endowed her. As a child she was beautiful, she continued to grow in beauty, and at the age of sixteen she was most lovely. The fame of her beauty began to spread abroad through all the villages around Minas, but why do I say the villages around, merely, when it spread to distant cities, and even made its way into the halls of royalty and reached the ears of people of every class, who came from all sides to see her as if to see something rare and curious, or some wonder minus working image. Her father watched over her, and she watched over herself, for there are no locks, or guards, or bolts that can protect a young girl better than her own modesty. The wealth of the father and the beauty of the daughter led many neighbors, as well as strangers to seek her for a wife, but he as one might well be who had the disposal of so rich a jewel, was perplexed, and unable to make up his mind to which of her countless suitors he should entrust her. I was one among the many who felt a desire so natural, and, as her father knew who I was, and I was of the same town, of pure blood, in the bloom of life, and very rich in possessions, I had great hopes of success. There was another of the same place and qualifications who also sought her, and this made her father's choice hang in the balance, for he felt that on either of us his daughter would be well bestowed, so to escape from this state. Of perplexity he resolved to refer the matter to Leandra, for that is the name of the rich. Damsel who has reduced me to misery, reflecting that as we were both equal, it would be best to leave it to his dear daughter to choose according to her inclination minus a course that is worthy of imitation by all fathers who wish to settle their children in life. I do not mean that they ought to leave them to make a choice of what is contemptible and bad, but that they should place before them what is good, and then allow them to make a good choice as they please. I do not know which Leandra chose, I only know her father put us both off with the tender age of his daughter and vague words that neither bound him nor dismissed us. My rival is called Anselmo, and I myself Eugenio Minus that you may know the names of the personages that figure in this tragedy, the end of which is still in suspense, though it is plain to see it must be disastrous. Don Quixote Chapter 51 387 About this time there arrived in our town one Vicente de la Roca, the son of a poor peasant of the same town, the said Vicente having returned from service as a soldier in Italy and divers other parts. A captain who chanced to pass that way with his company had carried him off from our village when he was a boy of about twelve years, and now twelve years later the young man came back in a soldier's uniform, arrayed in a thousand colors, and all over glass trinkets and fine steel chains. To minus day he would appear in one gay dress, to minus morrow in another, but all flimsy and gaudy, of little substance and less worth. The peasant folk, who are naturally malicious, and when they have nothing to do can be malice itself, remarked all this, and took note of his finery and jewelry, piece by piece, and discovered that he had three suits of different colors, with garters and stockings to match, but he made so many arrangements and combinations out of them, that if they had not counted them, anyone would have sworn that he had made a display of more than ten suits of clothes and twenty plumes. Do not look upon all this that I am telling you about the clothes as uncalled for or spun out for they have a great deal to do with the story. He used to seat himself on a bench under the great poplar in our plaza, and there he would keep us all hanging open minus mouthed on the stories he told us of his exploits. There was no country on the face of the globe he had not seen, nor battle he had not been engaged in, he had killed more moors than there are in Morocco and Tunis, and fought more single combats, according to his own account, than Garcilaso, Diego Garcia de Paredes and a thousand others he named, and out of all he had come victorious without losing a drop of blood. On the other hand he showed marks of wounds, which, though they could not be made out, he said were gunshot wounds received in diverse encounters and actions. Lastly, with monstrous impudence he used to say you to his equals, and even those who knew what he was, and declare that his arm was his father and his deeds his pedigree, and that being a soldier he was as good as the king himself. 
And to add to these swaggering ways he was a trifle of a musician, and played the guitar with such a flourish that some said he made it speak. Nor did his accomplishments end here, for he was something of a poet too, and on every trifle that happened in the town he made a ballad a league long. This soldier then, that I have described, this Vicente de la Roca, this bravo, gallant, musician, poet, was often seen and watched by Leandra from a window of her house which looked out on the plaza. The glitter of his showy attire took her fancy, his ballads bewitched her, for he gave away twenty copies of every one he made, the tales of his exploits which he told about himself came to her ears, and in short, as the devil no doubt had arranged it, she fell in love with him before the presumption of making love to her had suggested itself to him, and as in love minus affairs none are more easily brought to an issue than those which have the inclination of the lady for an ally, Leandra and Vicente came to an understanding without any difficulty, and before any of her numerous suitors had any suspicion of her design, she had already carried it into effect, having left the house of her dearly beloved. Father, for mother she had none, and disappeared from the village with the soldier who came more triumphantly out of this enterprise than out of any of the large number he laid claim to. All the village and all who heard of it were amazed at the affair. I was aghast, and Selmo thunderstruck, her father full of grief, her relations indignant, the authorities all in. Don Quixote Chapter 51 388 Affirmant, the officers of the Brotherhood in arms. They scoured the roads, they searched the woods in all quarters, and at the end of three days they found the flighty Leandra in a mountain cave, stripped to her shift, and robbed of all the money and precious jewels she had carried away from home with her. They brought her back to her unhappy father, and questioned her as to her misfortune, and she confessed without pressure that Vicente de la Roca had deceived her and under promise of marrying her had induced her to leave her father's house, as he meant to take her to the richest and most delightful city in the whole world, which was Naples, and that she, Ilminus advised and deluded, had believed him, and robbed her father, and handed over all to him the night she disappeared, and that he had carried her away to a rugged mountain, and shut her up in the eve where they had found her. She said, moreover, that the soldier, without robbing her of her honor, had taken from her everything she had, and made off, leaving her in the cave, a thing that still further surprised everybody. It was not easy for us to credit the young man's continence, but she asserted it with such earnestness that it helped to console her distressed father, who thought nothing of what had been taken since the jewel that once lost can never be recovered had been left to his daughter. The same day that Leandra made her appearance her father removed her from her sight and took her away to shut her up in a convent in a town near this, in the hope that time may wear away some of the disgrace she has incurred. Leandra's youth furnished an excuse for her fault, at least with those to whom it was of no consequence whether she was good or bad, but those who knew her shrewdness and intelligence did not attribute her misdemeanor to ignorance, but to wantonness and the natural disposition of women, which is for the most part flighty and Ilminus regulated. Leandra withdrawn from sight, and Selmo's eyes grew blind, or at any rate found nothing to look at that gave them any pleasure, and mine were in darkness without a ray of light to direct them to anything enjoyable while Leandra was away. Our melancholy grew greater, our patience grew less, we cursed the soldier's finery and railed at the carelessness of Leandra's father. At last Anselmo and I agreed to leave the village and come to this valley, and, he feeding a great flock of sheep of his own, and I a large herd of goats of mine, we pass our life among the trees, giving vent to our sorrows, together singing the fair Leandra's praises, or upbraiding her, or else sighing alone, and to heaven pouring forth our complaints in solitude. Following our example, many more of Leandra's lovers have come to these rude mountains and adopted our mode of life, and they are so numerous that one would fancy the place had been turned into the pastoral Arcadia, so full is it of shepherds and sheep minus folds. Nor is there a spot in it where the name of the fair Leandra is not heard. Here one curses her and calls her capricious, fickle, and immodest, there another condemns her as frail and frivolous, this pardons and absolves her that spurns and reviles her, one extols her beauty, another assails her character, and in short all abuse her, and all adore her, and to such a pitch has this general infatuation gone that there are some who complain of her scorn without ever having exchanged a word with her, and even some that bewail and mourn the raging fever of jealousy, for which she never gave anyone cause, for, as I have already said, her misconduct was known before her passion. There is no nook among the rocks, no brookside, no shade beneath the trees that is not haunted by some shepherd telling his woes to the breezes. Don Quixote Chapter 51 389 Wherever there is an echo it repeats the name of Leandra, the mountains ring with Leandra, Leandra murmur the brooks, 
and Leandra keeps us all bewildered and bewitched, hoping without hope and fearing without knowing what we fear. Of all this silly set the one that shows the least and also the most sense is my rival Anselmo, for having so many other things to complain of, he only complains of separation, and to the accompaniment of a rebeck, which he plays admirably, he sings his complaints in verses that show his ingenuity. I follow another, easier, and to my mind wiser course, and that is to rail at the frivolity of women, at their inconstancy, their double dealing, their broken promises, their unkept pledges, and in short the want of reflection they show in fixing their affections and inclinations. This, sirs, was the reason of words and expressions I made use of to this goat when I came up just now, for as she is a female I have a contempt for her, though she is. The best in all my fold. This is the story I promised to tell you, and if I have been tedious in telling it, I will not be slow to serve you, my hut is close by, and I have fresh milk and dainty cheese there, as well as a variety of toothsome fruit, no less pleasing to the eye than to the palate. Don Quixote Chapter 51 390 Chapter 52 Oweth the quarrel that Don Quixote had with the goat herd, together with the rare adventure of the penitence, which with an expenditure of sweat he brought to a happy conclusion. The goat herd's tale gave great satisfaction to all the hearers, and the canon especially enjoyed it, for he had remarked with particular attention the manner in which it had been told, which was as unlike the manner of a clownish goat herd as it was like that of a polished city wit, and he observed that the curate had been quite right in saying that the woods bred men of learning. They all offered their services to Eugenio, but he who showed himself most liberal in this way was Don Quixote, who said to him, Most assuredly, Brother Goatherd, if I found myself in a position to attempt any adventure, I would, this very instant, set out on your behalf, and would rescue Leandra from that convent, where no doubt she is kept against her will, in spite of the abbess and all who might try to prevent me, and would place her in your hands to deal with her according to your will and pleasure, observing, however, the laws of chivalry which lay down that no violence of any kind is to be offered to any. Damsel. But I trust in God our Lord that the might of one malignant enchanter may not prove so great, but that the power of another better disposed may prove superior to it, and then I promise you my support and assistance, as I am bound to do by my profession, which is none other than to give aid to the weak and needy. The goat herd eyed him, and noticing Don Quixote's sorry appearance and looks, he was filled with wonder, and asked the barber, who was next him, Senor, who is this man who makes such a figure and talks in such a strain? Who should it be, said the barber, but the famous Don Quixote of La Mancha, the undoer of injustice, the righter of wrongs, the protector of damsels, the terror of giants, and the winner of battles. That, said the goat herd, sounds like what one reads in the books of the knights minus errant, who did all that you say this man does, though it is my belief that either you are joking, or else this gentleman has empty lodgings in his head. You are a great scoundrel, said Don Quixote, and it is you who are empty and a fool. I am fuller than ever was the horse on bitch that bore you, and passing from words to deeds, he caught up a loaf that was near him and sent it full in the goatherd's face, with such force that he flattened his nose, but the goatherd, who did not understand jokes, and found himself roughly handled in such good earnest, paying no respect to carpet, tablecloth or Don Quixote Chapter 52-391 Diners sprang upon Don Quixote, and seizing him by the throat with both hands would no doubt have throttled him, had not Sancho Panza, that instant come to the rescue, and grasping him by the shoulders flung him down on the table, smashing plates, breaking glasses, and upsetting and scattering everything on it. Don Quixote, finding himself free, strove to get on top of the goat herd, who, with his face covered with blood, and soundly kicked by Sancho, was on all fours feeling about for one of the table minus knives to take a bloody revenge with. The canon and the curate, however, prevented him, but the barber so contrived it that he got Don Quixote under him, and rained down upon him such a shower of fisticuffs that the poor knight's face streamed with blood as freely as his own. The canon and the curate were bursting with laughter, the officers were capering with delight, and both the one and the other hissed them on as they do dogs that are worrying one another in a fight. Sancho alone was frantic, for he could not free himself from the grasp of one of the canon servants, who kept him from going to his master's assistance. At last, while they were all, with the exception of the two bruisers who were mauling each other, in high glee and enjoyment, 
They heard a trumpet sound a note so doleful that it made them all look in the direction whence the sound seemed to come. But the one that was most excited by hearing it was Don Quixote, who though sorely against his will he was under the goat herd, and something more than pretty well pummeled, said to him, Brother devil, for it is impossible, but that thou must be one since thou hast had might and strength enough to overcome mine. I ask thee to agree to a truce for but one hour for the solemn note of yonder trumpet that falls on our ears seems to me to summon me to some new adventure. The goat herd, who was by this time tired of pummeling and being pummeled, released him at once, and Don Quixote rising to his feet and turning his eyes to the quarter where the sound had been heard, suddenly saw coming down the slope of a hill several men, clad in white like penitents. The fact was that the clouds had that year withheld their moisture from the earth, and in all the villages of the district they were organizing processions, rogations, and penances, imploring God to open the hands of his mercy and send the rain and to this end the people of a village that was hard by were going in procession to a holy hermitage there was on one side of that valley. Don Quixote when he saw the strange garb of the penitents, without reflecting how often he had seen it before, took it into his head that this was a case of adventure, and that it fell to him alone as a knight minus errant to engage in it, and he was all the more confirmed in this notion, by the idea that an image draped in black they had with them was some illustrious lady that these villains and discourteous thieves were carrying off by force. As soon as this occurred to him he ran with all speed to Rocinante who was grazing at large and taking the bridle and the buckler from the saddle minus bow, he had him bridled in an instant and calling to Sancho for his sword he mounted Rocinante, braced his buckler on his arm, and in a loud voice exclaimed to those who stood by, Now, noble company, ye shall see how important it is that there should be knights in the world professing thee of knight minus errantry. Now, I say, ye shall see, by the deliverance of that worthy lady who was born captive there, whether knights minus errant deserve to be held in estimation, and so saying he. Don Quixote Chapter 52-392 Brought his legs to bear on Rocinante minus four he had no spurs minus, and at a full canter, for in all this voracious history we never read of Rocinante fairly galloping, set off to encounter the penitents, though the curate, the cannon, and the barber ran to prevent him. But it was out of their power, nor did he even stop for the shouts of Sancho calling after him, Where are you going, Senor Don Quixote? What devils have possessed you to set you on against our Catholic faith? Plague take me. Mind, that is a procession of penitents, and the lady they are carrying on that stand there is the blessed image of the Immaculate Virgin. Take care what you are doing, Senor, for this time it may be safely said you don't know what you are about. Sancho labored in vain, for his master was so bent on coming to quarters with these sheeted figures and releasing the lady in black that he did not hear a word, and even had he heard, he would not have turned back if the king had ordered him. He came up with the procession and reigned in Rocinante, who was already anxious enough to slacken speed a little, and in a hoarse, excited voice he exclaimed, You who hide your faces, perhaps because you are not good subjects, pay attention and listen to what I am about to say to you. The first to halt were those who were carrying the image, and one of the four ecclesiastics who were chanting the litany, struck by the strange figure of Don Quixote, the leanness of Rocinante, and the other ludicrous peculiarities he observed, said in reply to him, Brother, if you have anything to say to us say it quickly, for these brethren are whipping themselves, and we cannot stop, nor is it reasonable we should stop to hear anything, unless indeed it is short enough to be said in two words. I will say it in one, re replied Don Quixote, and it is this that at once, this very instant, ye release that fair lady whose tears and sad aspect show plainly that ye are carrying her off against her will, and that ye have committed some scandalous outrage against her, and I who was born into the world to redress all such like wrongs, will not permit you to advance another step until you have restored to her the liberty she pines for and deserves. From these words all the hearers concluded that he must be a madman, and began to laugh heartily, and their laughter acted like gunpowder on Don Quixote's fury, for drawing his sword without another word he made a rush at the stand. One of those who supported it, leaving the burden to his comrades, advanced to meet him, flourishing a forked stick that he had for propping up the stand when resting, and with this he caught a mighty cut Don Quixote made it in that severed it in two, but with the portion that remained in his hand he dealt such a thwack on the shoulder of Don Quixote's sword arm, which the buckler could not protect against the clownish assault, that poor Don Quixote came to the ground in a sad plight. Sancho Panza, who was coming on close behind puffing and blowing, seeing him fall, cried out to his assailant not to strike him again, for he was poor enchanted knight, who had never harmed anyone all the days of his life, 
But what check the clown was, not Sancho shouting, but seeing that Don Quixote did not stir hand or foot, and so, fancying he had killed him, he hastily hitched up his tunic under his girdle, and took to his heels across the country like a deer. Don Quixote Chapter 52 393 By this time all Don Quixote's companions had come up to where he lay, but the processionists, seeing them come running, and with them the officers of the Brotherhood with their crossbows, apprehended mischief, and clustering round the image, raised their hoods, and grasped their scourges, as the priests did their tapers, and awaited the attack, resolved to defend themselves, and even to take the offensive against their assailants if they could. Fortune, however, arranged the matter better than they expected, for all Sancho did was to fling himself on his master's body, raising over him the most doleful and laughable lamentation that ever was heard, for he believed he was dead. The curate was known to another curate who walked in the procession, and their recognition of one another set at rest the apprehensions of both parties. The first then told the other in two words who Don Quixote was, and he and the whole troop of penitents went to see if the poor gentleman was dead, and heard Sancho Panza saying, with tears in his eyes, O flower of chivalry, that with one blow of a stick hast ended the course of thy well minus spent life. O pride of thy race, honor and glory of all La Mancha, nay, of all the world, that for want of thee will be full of evil minus doers, no longer in fear of punishment for their misdeeds. O thou, generous above all the Alexanders, since for only eight months of service thou hast given me the best island the sea girds or surrounds. Humble with the proud, haughty with the humble, encounterer of dangers, endurer of outrages, enamored without reason, imitator of the good, scourge of the wicked, enemy of the mean, in short, knight minus errant, which is all that can be said. At the cries and moans of Sancho, Don Quixote came to himself, and the first word he said was, He who lives separated from you, sweetest Dulcinea, has greater miseries to endure than these. Aid me, friend Sancho, to mount the enchanted cart, for I am not in a condition to press the saddle of Rocinante, as this shoulder is all knocked to pieces. That I will do with all my heart, senor, said Sancho, and let us return to our village with these gentlemen, who seek your good, and there we will prepare for making another sally, which may turn out more profitable and creditable to us. Thou art right, Sancho, returned Don Quixote, it will be wise to let the malign influence of the stars which now prevails pass off. The canon, the curate, and the barber told him he would act very wisely in doing as he said, and so, highly amused at Sancho Panza's simplicities, they placed Don Quixote in the cart as before. The procession once more formed itself in order and proceeded on its road, the goatherd took his leave of the party, the officers of the Brotherhood declined to go any farther, and the curate paid them what was due to them, the canon begged the curate to let him know how Don Quixote did, whether he was cured of his madness or still suffered from it, and then begged leave to continue his journey, in short, they all separated and went their ways, leaving to themselves the curate and the barber, Don Quixote, Sancho Panza, and the good Rocinante, who regarded everything with as great resignation as his master. The carter yoked his oxen and made Don Quixote comfortable on a truss of hay, and at his usual. Deliberate pace took the road the curate directed, and at the end of six days they reached Don. Don Quixote Chapter 52 394 Quixote's village and entered it about the middle of the day, which it so happened was a Sunday, and the people were all in the plaza, through which Don Quixote's cart passed. They all flocked to see what was in the cart, and when they recognized their townsman they were filled with amazement, and a boy ran off to bring the news to his housekeeper, and his niece that their master and uncle had come back all lean and yellow and stretched on a truss of hay on an ox minus cart. It was piteous to hear the cries the two good ladies raised, how they beat their breasts, and poured out fresh maledictions on those accursed books of chivalry, all which was renewed when they saw Don Quixote coming in at the gate. At the news of Don Quixote's arrival Sancho Panza's wife came running, for she by this time knew that her husband had gone away with him as his squire, and on seeing Sancho, the first thing she asked him was if the ass was well. Sancho replied that he was, better than his master was. Thanks be to God, said she, for being so good to me, but now tell me, my friend, what have you made by your squirings? What gown have you brought me back? What shoes for your children? I bring nothing of that sort, wife, said Sancho, though I bring other things of more consequence and value. I am very glad of that, return his wife, show me these things of more value and consequence, my friend, for I want to see them to cheer my heart that has been so sad and heavy all these ages that you have been away. I will show them to you at home, wife, said Sancho, 
be content for the present, for if it please God that we should again go on our travels in search of adventures, you will soon see me a count, or governor of an island, and that not one of those everyday ones, but the best that is to be had. Heaven grant it, husband, said she, for indeed we have need of it. But tell me, what's this about islands, for I don't understand it? Honey is not for the mouth of the ass, returned Sancho, all in good time thou shalt see, wife minus nay, thou wilt be surprised to hear thyself called your ladyship by all thy vassals. What are you talking about, Sancho, with your ladyship's islands and vassals? Returned Teresa Panza minus four so Sancho's wife was called, though they were not relations, for in La Mancha it is customary for wives to take their husband's surnames. Don't be in such a hurry to know all this, Teresa, said Sancho, it is enough that I am telling you the truth, so shut your mouth. But I may tell you this much by the way, that there. Don Quixote Chapter 52 395 Is nothing in the world more delightful than to be a person of consideration, squire to a knight minus errant, and a seeker of adventures? To be sure most of those one finds do not end as pleasantly as one could wish, for out of a hundred, ninety minus nine will turn out cross and contrary. I know it by experience, for out of some I came blanketed, and out of others belabored. Still, for all that, it is a fine thing to be on the look minus out for what may happen, crossing mountains, searching woods, climbing rocks, visiting castles, putting up at inns, all at free quarters, and devil take the Maravedi to pay. While this conversation passed between Sancho Panza and his wife, Don Quixote's housekeeper, and niece took him in and undressed him and laid him in his old bed. He eyed them askance and could not make out where he was. The curate charged his niece to be very careful to make her uncle comfortable and to keep a watch over him lest he should make his escape from them again, telling her what they had been obliged to do to bring him home. On this the pair once more lifted up their voices and renewed their maledictions upon the books of chivalry and implored heaven to plunge the authors of such lies and nonsense into the midst of the bottomless pit. They were, in short, kept in anxiety and dread lest their uncle and master should give them the slip the moment he found himself somewhat better, and as they feared so it fell out. But the author of this history, though he has devoted research and industry to the discovery of the deeds achieved by Don Quixote in his third sally, has been unable to obtain any information respecting them, at any rate derived from authentic documents, tradition has merely preserved in the memory of La Mancha the fact that Don Quixote, the third time he sallied forth from his home, betook himself to Saragossa, where he was present at some famous justs which came off in that city and that he had adventures there worthy of his valor and high intelligence. Of his end and death he could learn no particulars, nor would he have ascertained it or known of it, if good fortune had not produced an old physician for him who had in his possession a leaden box, which, according to his account, had been discovered among the crumbling foundations of an ancient hermitage that was being rebuilt, in which box were found certain parchment manuscripts in Gothic character, but in Castilian. Verse, containing many of his achievements, and setting forth the beauty of Dulcinea the form of Rocinante, the fidelity of Sancho Panza, and the burial of Don Quixote himself, together with sundry epitaphs and eulogies on his life and character, but all that could be read and deciphered were those which the trustworthy author of this new and unparalleled history here presents. And the said author asks of those that shall read it nothing in return for the vast toil which it has cost him in examining and searching the Manchegan archives in order to bring it to light, save that they give him the same credit that people of sense give to the books of chivalry that pervade the world and are so popular, for with this he will consider himself amply paid and fully satisfied and will be encouraged to seek out and produce other histories, if not as truthful, at least. Equal in invention, and not less entertaining. The first words written on the parchment found in the leaden box were these. Don Quixote Chapter 52-396 The Academicians of Argamasilla, a village of L.A. Mancha, on the life and death of Don Quixote of L.A. Mancha, Hoc Scripturunt Monacongo, Academician of Argamasilla. On the Tomb of Don Quixote. Epitaph. The scatterbrain that gave La Mancha more rich spoils than Jason's, who a point so keen had to his wit, and happier far had been if his wit's weathercock a blunter bore, the arm renowned far as gate ashore, Cathay, and all the lands that lie between. The muse discreet and terrible in mean as ever wrote on brass in days of yore, he who surpassed the Amatuses all, and who was not the Gallers accounted, supported by his love and gallantry, who made the Belianuses sing small and sought. 
Renown on Rocinante mounted, here, underneath this cold stone, doth he lie. Paniaguado, Academician of Argamasilla, in Laudem Dulcinii del Toboso. Sonnet She, whose full features may be here descried, high minus bosomed, with a bearing of disdain, is Dulcinea, she for whom in vain the great Don Quixote of La Mancha sighed. For her, Toboso's queen, from side to side he traversed the grim Sierra, the Champagne of Aranjuez, and Montiel's famous plain, on Rocinante off a weary ride. Malignant planets, cruel destiny, pursued them both, the fair Manchegan dame, and the unconquered star of chivalry. Nor youth nor beauty saved her from the claim of death, he paid love's bitter penalty, and left the marble to preserve his name. Capriccioso, a most acute academician of Argamasilla, in praise of Rocinante, steed of Don Quixote of L.A. Mancha. Sonnet On that proud throne of diamantine sheen, which the blood minus reeking feet of Mars degrade, the mad Manchagan's banner now hath been by him in all its bravery displayed. There hath he hung his arms and trenchant blade wherewith, achieving deeds till now unseen, he slays, lays low, cleaves, hews, but art hath made a novel style for a new paladin. If Amatus be the proud boast of Gaul, if by his progeny the fame of Greece through all the regions of the earth be spread, great Quixote crown in grim Bologna's hall to minus day exalts La Mancha over these, and above Greece, or Gaul she holds her head. Nor ends his glory here, for his good steed doth Brilador and Bayard far exceed, as meddled. Don Quixote Chapter 52 397 Steeds compared with Rocinante, the reputation they have won is scanty. Berlador, Academician of Argamasilla, on Sancho Panza. Sonnet The worthy Sancho Panza here you see, a great soul once was in that body small, nor was there squire upon this earthly ball so plain and simple, or of guile so free. Within an ace of being count was he, and would have been but for the spite and gall of this vile age, mean and illiberal, that cannot even let a donkey be. For mounted on an ass, excuse the word, by Rocinante's side this gentle squire was wont his wandering master to attend. Delusive hopes that lure the common herd with promises of ease, the heart's desire, in shadows, dreams, and smoky always end. Cachidiablo, Academician of Argamasilla, on the tomb of Don Quixote Epitaph. The knight lies here below, ill minus errant and bruised sore, whom Rocinante bore in his wanderings to and fro. By the side of the knight is laid stolid man Sancho too, than whom a squire more true was not in the esquire trade. Tiquitoc, Academician of Argamasilla, on the tomb of Dulcinea del Toboso. Epitaph here Dulcinea lies. Plump was she and robust, now she is ashes and dust, the end of all flesh that dies. A lady of high degree, with the port of a lofty dame, and the great Don Quixote's flame, and the pride of her village was she. These were all the verses that could be deciphered, the rest, the writing being worm minus eaten, were handed over to one of the academicians to make out their meaning conjecturally. We have been informed that at the cost of many sleepless nights and much toil he has succeeded, and that he means to publish them in hopes of Don Quixote's third sally. Force ultro cantera con miglior plectro. Don Quixote. Chapter 52 398. Part 2. Don Quixote. Part 2 399 Dedication of Part 2 To the Count of Lemos These days passed, when Sending Your Excellency my plays, that had appeared in print before being shown on the stage, I said, if I remember well, that Don Quixote was putting on his spurs to go and render homage to Your Excellency. Now I say that with his spurs, he is on his way. Should he reach destination methinks, I shall have rendered some service to your excellency, as from many parts one am urged to send him off, so as to dispel the loathing and disgust caused by another Don Quixote who, under the name of second part, has run masquerading through the whole world. And he who has shown the greatest longing for him has been the great emperor of China, who wrote me a letter in Chinese a month ago and sent it by a special courier. He asked me, or to be truthful, he begged me to send him Don Quixote, for he intended to found a college where the Spanish tongue would be taught, and it was his wish that the book to be read should be the history of Don Quixote. 
He also added that I should go and be the rector of this college. I asked the bearer if His Majesty had afforded a sum in aid of my travel expenses. He answered, no, not even in thought. Then, brother, I replied, you can return to your China, post haste, or at whatever haste you are bound to go, as I am not fit for so long a travel and, besides being ill, I am very much without money, while emperor for emperor and monarch for monarch, I have at Naples the great Count of Lemos who, without so many petty titles of colleges and rectorships, sustains me, protects me and does me more favor than I can wish for. Thus I gave him his leave and I beg mine from you, offering your excellency the Trabajos de Persiles y Sigismunda, a book I shall finish within four months, Deo Volenti, and which will be either the worst or the best that has been composed in our language, I mean of those intended for entertainment, at which I repent of having called it the worst, for, in the opinion of friends, it is bound to attain the summit of possible quality. May your excellency return in such health that is wished you, Persiles will be ready to kiss your hand, and I your feet, being as I am, your excellency's most humble servant. From Madrid, this last day of October of the year 1615. At the service of Your Excellency, Miguel de Cervantes Saavedra, Don Quixote, Dedication of Part 2 400, Preface minus the author's preface. Goff bless me, gentle, or it may be plebeian, reader, how eagerly must thou be looking. Forward to this preface, expecting to find their retaliation, scolding, and abuse against the author of the second Don Quixote minus I mean him who was, they say, begotten at Tortillas and born at Tarragona. Well then, the truth is, I am not going to give thee that satisfaction, for, though injuries stir up anger in humbler breasts, in mine the rule must admit of an exception. Thou wouldst have me call him ass, fool, and malapert, but I have no such intention. Let his offense be his punishment, with his bread let him eat it, and there's an end of it. What I cannot help taking amiss is that he charges me with being old and one minus handed, as if it had been in my power to keep time from passing over me, or as if the loss of my hand had been brought about in some tavern, and not on the grandest occasion the past or present has seen, or the future can hope to see. If my wounds have no beauty to the beholder's eye, they are, at least, honorable in the estimation of those who know where they were received. For the soldier shows to greater advantage dead in battle than alive in flight, and so strongly is this my feeling, that if now it were proposed to perform an impossibility for me, I would rather have had my share in that mighty action, than be free from my wounds this minute without having been present at it. Those the soldier shows on his face and breast are stars that direct others to the heaven of honor and ambition of merited praise, and moreover it is to be observed that it is not with gray hairs that one writes, but with the understanding, and that commonly improves with years. I take it amiss too, that he calls me envious, and explains to me, as if I were ignorant, what envy is, for really and truly, of the two kinds there are, I only know that which is holy, noble, and high minus minded, and if that be so, as it is, I am not likely to attack a priest, above all if, in addition, he holds the rank of familiar of the holy office. And if he said what he did on account of him on whose behalf it seems he spoke, he is entirely mistaken, for I worship the genius of that person, and admire his works and his unceasing and strenuous industry. After all, I am grateful to this gentleman, the author, for saying that my novels are more satirical than exemplary, but that they are good, for they could not be that unless there was a little of everything in them. I suspect thou wilt say that I am taking a very humble line, and keeping myself too much within the bounds of my moderation, from a feeling that additional suffering should not be inflicted upon a sufferer, and that what this gentleman has to endure must doubtless be very great, as he does not dare to come out into the open field in broad daylight but hides his name and disguises his country as if he had been guilty of some lace majesty. If perchance thou shouldst come to know him, tell him for me that I do not hold myself aggrieved, for I know well what the temptations of the devil are, and that one of the greatest is putting it into a man's head that he can write and print a book by which he will get as much fame as money, and as much money as fame, and to prove it I will beg of you, in your own sprightly, pleasant way, to tell him this story. Don Quixote Preface minus the author's preface 401 there was a madman in Seville who took to one of the drollest absurdities and vagaries that ever madman in the world gave way to. It was this, he made a tube of reed sharp at one end and catching a dog in the street, or wherever it might be, he with his foot held one of its legs fast, and with his hand lifted up the other, and as best he could fix the tube where, by blowing, he made the dog as round as a ball, then holding it in this position, he gave it a couple of slaps on the belly, and let it go, saying to the bystanders, and there were always plenty of them do your worships think, now, that it is an easy 
thing to blow up a dog? Minus does your worship think now that it is an easy thing to write a book? And if this story does not suit him, you may, dear reader, tell him this one, which is likewise of a madman and a dog. In Cordova there was another madman, whose way it was to carry a piece of marble slab or a stone, not of the lightest, on his head, and when he came upon any unwary dog he used to draw close to him and let the weight fall right on top of him, on which the dog in a rage, barking and howling, would run three streets without stopping. It so happened however, that one of the dogs he discharged his load upon was a cat minus maker's dog, of which his master was very fond. The stone came down hitting it on the head, the dog raised a yell at the blow, the master saw the affair and was wroth, and snatching up a measuring minus yard rushed out at the madman and did not leave a sound bone in his body, and at every stroke he gave him he said, you dog, you thief. My lurcher. Don't you see, you brute, that my dog is a lurcher, and so, repeating the word lurcher again and again, he sent the madman away beaten to a jelly. The madman took the lesson to heart and vanished, and for more than a month never once showed himself in public, but after that he came out again with his old trick and a heavier load than ever. He came up to where there was a dog, and examining it very carefully without venturing to let the stone fall, he said, this is a lurcher, where? In short, all the dogs he came across, be they mastiffs or terriers, he said were lurchers, and he discharged no more stones. Maybe it will be the same with this historian, that he will not venture another time to discharge the weight of his wit in books, which, being bad, are harder than stones. Tell him, too, that I do not care a farthing for the threat he holds out to me of depriving me of my profit by means of his book, for, to borrow from the famous interlude of the Parandenga, I say in answer to him, long life to my lord the Ventiquatro, and Christ be with us all. Long life to the great Conde de Lemos, whose Christian charity, and well minus known generosity support me against all the strokes of my cursed fortune, and long life to the supreme benevolence of his eminence of Toledo, Don Bernardo. Descend of all Y. Rojas, and what matter if there be no printing minus presses in the world, or if they print more books against me than there are letters in the verses of Mingo Revolgo. These two princes, unsought by any adulation or flattery of mine, of their own goodness alone, have taken it upon them to show me kindness and protect me, and in this I consider myself happier and richer than if fortune had raised me to her greatest height in the ordinary way. The poor man may retain honor, but not the vicious, poverty may cast a cloud over nobility, but cannot hide it altogether, and as virtue of itself sheds a certain light, even though it be through the straits and chinks of penury, it wins the esteem of lofty and noble.